movies that made me. I, I, I tasked you with picking a movie. The only rule that I gave was pick a movie that's influential to you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, a lot of people here obviously were like, oh, it's going to be Star Wars. <laughs> um, why? That, that's the first question, of course. Why did you choose Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? Um, well, for one, this movie was the first movie that got me interested in Hindu culture. I didn't really know much about it, uh, obviously, when I was a kid. Uh, in this film, uh, what I didn't know then, it is not a fair representation of Indian culture at all. In fact, it's almost uh, kind of almost cringeworthy watching it today because they really are just a beautiful people, one of the most uh, peaceful people on the planet, and uh, uh, compared to most cultures, have a pretty pretty uh, peaceful history, uh, but it's a movie, it's fiction, and uh, um, and uh, it, it terrified me as a kid, but I think the thing that was magical for me, I've heard a lot of other creatives say that 12 years old is really your magic time, it's when you're kind of still a kid and you've got that, you, you know, that sense of wonderment, but you're also turning into an adult and, you know, you're starting to get the pressures of, uh, responsibility and everything else and um, uh, they say that whatever you were into when you were 12 years old that is kind of what you're into for the rest of your life and for me when I was 12 this movie came out uh, Prince's Purple Rain was one of the big wreckers uh, Van Halen 1984 uh, Duran Duran Rio and that and like Dungeons and Dragons was really big and uh, so this was my uh, this is who I am today, and I believe it so much. You know how there's a store called Forever 21? Yeah. I actually have Forever 12 tattooed on my shoulder. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, right That's over awesome. here. That's so, awesome. Yeah, the, uh, this movie, um, especially, I know that there was a lot of controversy uh, over the years as, as, you know, as people kind of understood more about representation and things like that, especially with the food uh, sequences. Like, that is not exactly... None of those things are based in any level of reality no. as to any kind of cuisine <laughs> that has ever been served in India no. at any point. Um, they're not eating bugs and, and chilled monkey brains. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I also found it interesting, I, I was laughing throughout the movie with my wife, um, this movie was rated PG. <laughs> uh, about two, this is also one of the films that caused the PG-13 rating to come about. Yeah. Uh, this and also Gremlins, which is another great PG movie from 1984. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're ripping a guy's heart out. I remember that watching that as a kid. I was, you know, I was five when this movie came out. I don't know if I remember it, it in the theater, but I was huge into it, like, on VHS, because I remember when Last Crusade came out, I was the same as you. Like, that yeah. movie to me was like, oh, my God, I can't believe there's a new Indiana Jones movie. Um, so Matt, though, let's backtrack just a little bit. Tell people here, I kind of gave a, a butchered, um, selective introduction to your career. Tell people what it is you do and, and kind of give them a, a broad strokes of, of what you have done in your amazing career. Um, well, I, uh, I grew up in Sterling Heights. Um, I've got some friends here, like my buddy Scott, who I went to school with when I was a kid. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I just grew up, you know, I grew up in a time where uh, probably about the time that, that this movie came out when I was realizing I have to be an adult, I was really nervous because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And back then, you have to choose one thing to be great at, and that's it. Otherwise, you're spreading yourself right. too thin. So I grew up at the perfect time because when I was a kid, man, I wanted to make comic books. I wanted to design video games. I wanted to make movies. I wanted to write stories. Uh, but you know, I, I knew I couldn't do it all, but I grew up at the perfect time because now it's almost the opposite. The more hats you can wear, the more viable you are in the industry. And it's just, it's never been easier uh, to kind of do it all. And when something is slow, you just kind of jump into something else. So the world has kind of changed. But um, uh, anyway, so I grew, I grew up having all of these crazy interests. I uh, moved out to Los Angeles during the 90s uh, I went to Art Center and I started working uh, in movies, but storyboarding and doing concept art. And um, that lasted for a while. And uh, ultimately though, I knew um, because I'm a Midwest boy and uh, I didn't really gel with uh, the Los Angeles type, um, 
I eventually moved back and I had big dreams for doing uh, for doing movies, but I wanted to do it my way. I just didn't, you know, the whole, the way that everything is kind of run in Hollywood. Um, and I was working on really cool movies like The Matrix, but I was one name, like an ant moving up at the end of the screen and a lot of talented people out there, but I knew uh, ultimately it would be easier to, uh, to move back home. Detroit has a really good work ethic. I love when people wear, have you guys seen those shirts that say Detroit hustles harder? It's, it's so true, we really do. We just have a great work, work, ethic, a work, a great work ethic here. And so I've been uh, building my army and creating my own sci-fi trilogy and uh, enjoying it quite a bit. Actually, Eric Steele, who plays Aladdin, is, uh, is here. James Carwin is here. Right. My is here. Um, uh, so anyway, so, uh, so I do a little bit of everything, but most people know me for the Star Wars art that I do, and I've done some Indiana Jones uh, work as well, which we've got some Indiana Jones stuff that I'll be, uh, that we'll be raffling off. And uh, yeah. Now tell people that what that means too, when you say you're a Star Wars artist, um, t tell them the types of stuff that you've done. Uh, you know, did, have you, did you work on the movies themselves or you know, what, what kind of stuff are you mostly known for yeah. as far as what you've done? So it, mostly I work in licensing and merchandising. So I've illustrated posters, book covers, uh, toy packaging, um, McDonald's uh, placemats, you know, the stuff people get ketchup all over and crumple and throw away. Um, yeah, uh, t-shirts, if you go to Kohl's and you see their Star Wars shirts, uh, there's a chance I might have uh, done the illustration for it. Um, so, you know, a little bit of everything. Now, you said you were 12 when you saw this film. What's, when's the last time you had seen this movie? Gosh, uh, I think my girlfriend Casey and I watched it probably a year or two Casey ago. Casey Hi, Casey. I'm going to get up for Casey. <laughs> <laughs> about a year ago? Yeah. Okay. So this is one that kind of just keeps reoccurring throughout your life here and there. You'll check it yeah. out. And I, and, and I would say for people that are Indiana Jones fans, there's no denying that Raiders is a better film. But this one's my favorite, and this is the one that I feel like I can just watch over and over and over again. Yes. Um, it's my favorite. That's what I love about, again, the, the concept of this series is not about what's the best movie, what's, yeah. what's your, you know, your favorite movie. It's a movie that has influenced you, you know, like, and it, it's crazy. We all have those movies that are not good movies that maybe we're even embarrassed to tell people that we like them or, you know, uh, think about them all the time. Uh, anybody seen Popeye with Robin Williams? Yeah, yeah it's super, super like uh, influential to me, and yeah, not one that shows up on a lot of lists. You know, you don't really see that that, that often. Uh, Matt, though, so I'm interested in this too. You know, uh, this movie was influential to you. It sounds like you were always interested in art and creating. Um, has this just been in like has this been inside of you like since a child like you were a child was there a turning point at some like that you felt you went into this direction um, reading you know about you it, on, you know online which has to be true because it's online mm -hmm. um, uh, you had really supportive parents mm -hmm. they're, and they're here tonight oh they're they are really too right hey mom dad how are you doing yeah so. The, the moral of the story is you have to have very supportive parents that will push you into the things that you're passionate about. Um, but but I guess maybe that's a better question for mom and dad. Has it always been in Matt? Some people can't be pushed. Okay, there you go. That's good. He was driven. That's good. Uh, do you feel like there was something, like a moment or whatever, where you felt like, you know, I need to go in this direction? I think it was always there, but I think the thing that I started kind of picking up on at this age that I really started to understand with this film is I started um, I started thinking about stories and I started thinking about taking the audience on a journey. And the thing about this movie that really struck me as a kid is the constant back and forth between being on the edge of your seat, being terrified, laughing hysterically. Um, you know, there's a little bit of romance in there. And as a, and the, you know, the other big thing that I really loved about this is I'm actually the same age as Kihu Kwan, 
uh, who actually just won an Oscar, which is which is amazing. Yeah. But uh, I was just telling my dad, uh, he who yeah. Quan now has more Oscars than Harrison Ford. Well, yeah, you would have never thought that. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. But um, the thing that was really neat for me, uh, I'm the same age as Key, so uh, it was really neat for me already being a huge Indiana Jones fan, fan from Raiders of the Lost Ark. But it was so cool to see that Indiana Jones' best friend was a kid my age. Like, oh my gosh, that just makes him even cooler, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. This movie, too, you know, uh, like, ultimately ended up being, uh, I guess it's a prequel, if you mm -hmm. consider it. That yeah. wasn't even a thing, really, then. Like, people weren't making a lot of prequels to movies. Uh, and I like uh, Roger Ebert, who loved this movie, gave it four out of four stars when it came out. Uh, he called this not a sequel, but an equal to Raiders of the Lost Ark, which oh, I thought was cool. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, the movie itself, you know, it was it was kind of dark. I mean, it, it is dark. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something? Because I know a lot of looking at a lot of your art too. You, you you're into a lot of like horror kind of you know genre, uh, that kind of stuff. Did that darkness of this movie was that part of what appealed to you? It definitely was. But and the thing that I that I probably didn't know then that I know now is a lot of times your hero is only as good as the obstacles that they have to overcome. So if you have a movie with where there's, I don't know, Superman and everything's easy and it's apple pie and it's never difficult, I mean, then it's really not that much of a hero. But if you, uh, if you take someone, drag them through the mud and just make it seem impossible, I mean, in this one, Indiana Jones turns evil for crying out loud, you know? Um, so it's really dark, but I think it's uh, the stakes are the highest. And... Uh, and I just love it about that. I think one of the reasons I really like this one, it's the most different of the Indiana Jones movies. And there were a lot of people that didn't like this one because it was so dark. And so after this, it seems like all they keep doing is recreating Raiders of the Lost Ark and bringing the Nazis back and kind of going back to that formula. But that's one of the reasons I like this one the best is they really tried something different it is yeah. it is definitely the most different of the indiana jones movies and and you think of too i was listening or, you know to this movie of course john john williams who's a master but how <laughs> unique like you know the indiana jones theme is in this movie of course you know every time he you know jumps up or whatever but the, 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 like the whole like theme of like when they're in the temple all the, the those themes like they stuck in my mind like as they were playing i hadn't heard it in 35 years or whatever uh or 30 you know last time i seen it but I, they were instantly familiar, and it was almost like even from that perspective, this movie took like leaps where, you know, I can't think of the Last Crusade like you know, yeah, that, that just is the Indiana Jones theme. You know, they all have that main Indiana Jones theme, but this one had something more like experimental and more and more different, even on that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Short Round's got a great theme, and uh, and and Willie Scott has a great theme, so. I love it. And now you you compose as well. You did it for a film. That you I did. I I don't I, I I create music sometimes by taking different production assets. Uh, so in the Aladdin films, there are some sequences where I took beats and then I took different music uh, uh, production samples that I put together. So it's kind of like I created some of the music, but. Um, I usually either get um, a licensed music that's perfect, way better than I would ever be able to do, um, or uh, or Cell Dweller did a lot of the music okay. Uh, okay. that I licensed for the film. How much you know you like we talked about? You're into a bunch of different stuff. You you've you've worked across so many different industries. Uh, how would you categorize the movie industry as being like? in general influential in your life uh, is it still to this day do you draw inspiration from movies uh, or I guess wh where do where does the movie industry fit into your your makeup gosh um, it's it's just one of many I also grew up on comic books and and books mad magazine um, all kinds of stuff but movies movies was huge and it was also really cool that I grew up uh, right as VHS was coming out, so this was a film, for example, that I remember watching a lot on VHS yeah. and being able to to relive it, you know, on and on at home. Is there anything, uh, having seen it tonight, that on the big screen that like jumped out of you or like something that you hadn't realized? Or... Yeah. Uh, well, one thing is um, I I remembered as a kid 
um, when Willie Scott spits in Harrison Ford's face, I always remembered it being more gooey and then watching it in VHS and I think uh, even recently watching it on Blu-ray, um, I remember thinking, man, I just, I remembered it being more gooey and like, it, you know, they probably should have made it more gooey seeing it on the big screen again. Oh yeah, that is pretty gooey. <laughs> so, so that's, I, I, I definitely noticed that. That's funny. Uh, I had thought, because again, in my mind, this movie, like, I, I probably wasn't supposed to be watching it, but it was PG. It was the 80s. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, though, being traumatized by the guys that were all being eaten by the alligators at the very end. Mm -hmm. And, and then I noticed today as an adult that, like, they just, like, show the guy fall, and then you see the alligators with, like, cloth. But in my imagination as a six-year-old, like, yeah. I was seeing the guy getting ripped apart, and I'm like, <laughs> I, I remembered that somehow. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so, uh, what do you, uh, I, I kind of want to hit back on this. So, like, I, I'm interested in getting into your mind, like, when you're creating stuff. Like, so let's say you're commissioned and, you know, to do uh, some kind of art that's in the realm of Star Wars. Um, what are you pulling inspiration from a lot of the stuff that I that I've seen I know you do a lot of original work as well but a lot of the stuff that you are doing is stuff that people are familiar with mm -hmm. so do, do you feel like that's in your realm like you have to make it familiar but kind of put your own spin on it I guess talk a, a, about the process of how you create yeah it's I mean each piece has its own challenge but one of the biggest challenges with creating artwork for something like Star Wars or Indiana Jones is there's already so much incredible work out there so it's uh coming up with something that people haven't seen before or presenting it in a way they haven't seen it before and sometimes that's tough to do i've had uh, a number of opportunities even in recent years where they'll say uh okay we've got this cover uh we want something with darth vader and it's like gosh what do i do that like you know i'll start to i'll go through photos and I'll be like, well, Dave Dorman already illustrated this photo. Drew Struzan already illustrated this photo. Gosh, I could do a thing where maybe there's a lava coming behind them. And then as I'm scrolling through, oh, someone else already did one with Darth Vader and lava, you know, sure. in the background. So uh, uh, just coming up with something new is, uh, is, is half the challenge. Did you, were there people that you tried to emulate when you were younger or starting off? Definitely. Uh, Drew Struzan was, was probably the most, but a lot of the poster artists kind of have a, a very similar technique with acrylics and color pencil. So, um, uh, you know, there's kind of a look for movie poster art. There's kind of like that Star Wars, Indiana Jones cinematic look, but Drew Struzan was, was, was probably the big one for sure. Are you, is there a type of art that you work with that you particularly are drawn to more like is it, is it more fun to do a poster versus uh like you said some of the licensing like a toy mm -hmm. or like do you do you f kind of find it um you know i guess is there a, a part of what you do that you enjoy other that more than another part i would say posters are usually the funnest uh for two reasons for one more people see them but the other reason that they're fun is they're giant posters. And usually when you're working on those, you're working on what's called a one-to-one -one ratio where the original artwork is exactly the same size as the poster. So what's great is after you create the piece, when you see the poster either in a store or if you see it in a movie theater, uh, as people are walking by, hopefully admiring it, it's almost like they're looking at your original artwork because it's the same size. Or something like a book, you're creating it a lot larger and then it's on a little paperback book it's still cool and a lot of people see it but now it's tiny right. you know? <laughs> um let's we're about to open it up for questions i want before we get into that though i want to talk more about what you're up to these days uh i keep going back to this idea that you've done a lot of stuff but i know that your a lot of your heart and soul has been into this project that we talked about at the beginning we saw the trailer aladdin uh, 3477 um, am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I always wonder like if the numbers are supposed to be said in a certain way or whatever. Uh, but tell people about this movie. Tell people about uh, the journey to get this movie. And then tell the fine people when it's going to be released. No, awesome. Kidding. So uh, it's a trilogy of movies. It's called Aladdin 3477. It's three films. And it took us five years just to film alone. 
and most of the filming we did here in Michigan. And um, they're just out there. It's, the, it's essentially the story of Aladdin, but there's a lot of twists and turns. But it takes place 1,500 years in the future. And it takes place in India and all through Southern Asia. And it's a globe-trotting adventure. And it's kind of, uh, it looks like Star Wars, but set in Asia, but it definitely has an Indiana Jones feel. Yeah. So if you enjoyed this movie, but if you uh -huh. like this kind of adventure, this kind of humor, um, then uh, I think you guys will dig these films. And the first one uh, hopefully comes out this year. Uh, do you want, can you give us any more specific on that? Like, I don't, you don't have to give us a date yeah. or other, but like, are, is it, hope, are you hoping to have it by fall? And, and what is it hanging on? Are you yeah. in post-production right now or like, what's the process? The film is essentially, I have a final cut. There's a couple things with sound that I keep, uh, th that I keep tweaking. But I think what I want to do in order to get a good distributor, I think I want to aim for some of the larger film festivals and see what sticks. So I think uh, uh, Sundance is what I think I'm, I'm aiming for. I might not get it, but, uh, but I'm going to, you know, my whole theory with everything that I do, I always say I aim for the moon, and even if I miss, then you land among the stars. So That's we'll, amazing. See, we'll see what sticks. That's super cool. And uh, you put about, you said about 10 years into the actual production of it? Uh, probably 13 years. 13 years. So far, yeah. How long is the idea of this? Does it go further back than that? Uh, it does. Actually, in college is when I started developing my sci-fi epic story. Um, but a year or two in, I was drawing it as a comic book at first. And then I realized, oh, no, my story is just like Aladdin. And, uh, but it didn't have a genie or wishes or anything like that. And other people probably wouldn't have noticed, but I could totally tell this is just like Aladdin in space. So I kind of scrapped it for a while, and when I realized that Aladdin was public domain, anyone can make an Aladdin movie, um, there was never an overnight thing, like, this is what I'll do. Because um, I didn't really like that idea either. I didn't want to do another, like, you know, Hansel and Gretel witch hunter thing, where it's just, uh, it just seems too easy. But the more I thought about it, um, I felt I had some really cool ideas, and suddenly that became more interesting than not doing Aladdin. And uh, over time, it just uh, that was what I was excited about. Well, your dad said it that he used the word driven. And, you know, from what I know of you, you just seem like a driven guy. Because because here's a guy again who not only like set out to make an independent film, like a lot of people do. You set out to make an independent film trilogy, mm -hmm. and then made all three of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people start off and they say, "I'm going to make a, I have a movie idea, but I'm going to make a 10 minute short and try to get that some traction, and then we'll see if somebody can, you know, get some funding and we'll make this thing into a real movie." You're like, you know what? I want this to be a trilogy. I'm going to make the whole damn thing yeah. <laughs> right off the bat. To talk a little bit about just, I mean, this is you would have to admit, even though you're in it, this is an, an ambitious. Uh, thing that you have taken on and but it seems to kind of track with everything else you've done yeah. in your life. Well I grew up in the 80s so the saying back then was go big or go home. <laughs> they might have just been talking about hair I'm not sure but, uh, <laughs> but um, no you know I always had this idea and this was kind of what I was thinking when I moved to Los Angeles is there was such a process for putting everything together and because it's the industry out there kind of like the the automotive industry is here it was just so clinical and there was just um, it was such a corporate way of putting everything together it just wasn't it wasn't fun it wasn't creative and I just I just had this idea way back then what would happen if I if I put something together if I spent years even if it took me years to make if I just made the best possible thing that I could and I remember even in the in the late 90s I remember there was an interview with George Lucas, and he said, in the future, blockbusters are gonna be made by uh, kids in their garage with a couple Mac computers. And I remember thinking, gosh, that's probably gonna be me. Um, and, uh, and I was real inspired by that. And I just, I've just always thought, man, what if I just, if I made something myself and, uh, um, and just went all in, no matter how long it takes me and, and do my best, um, that was always exciting to me, even if um, even if no one else is really into it, if I can impress myself and do something that I like. So what was interesting about recently when um, like the movie trailer just came out in January, prior to that, uh, in the prior 13 years, um, 
on social media, if I ever posted like even a scribble of Boba Fett on a napkin, I would get like 700 likes in a half hour. But no one was asking like, you know, oh man, it'd be cool if Matt Bush did a movie about Aladdin. Like that would be so <laughs> neat. No one was interested. No one was excited about it. But I would share, I didn't want to share too much too soon, but if I shared like, here's a look at one of the costumes. After two days, sometimes I would have two likes. Like it was, it was crickets, no one was interested. So I was fully prepared that uh, during the first initial push in January when the trailer came out, man, there's a good chance no one's gonna be into this either. And that's okay, you know, I'm proud of it. I know everyone that's worked on it and family and friends, they're gonna enjoy it, but there's a chance that's gonna be it. And so uh, the fact that it's exploded and we've had over 2.1 million views on YouTube and uh, everyone uh, everyone seems to be real excited about it. So uh, in fact, I get more, if I post on, uh, on social media about Aladdin 3477, I actually get more feedback and comments and shares than I do Star Wars stuff now, which wow. is which is awesome. Well, you have a great uh, social uh, approach. Like, uh, like you have so much content, and it's in, it's good, interesting content. Um, but like, I think I remember one too that drew me in, which was uh, you were like, well, you know, here's how how to even do a successful Kickstarter campaign. And it was oh, yeah. like tips for like people like who are wanting to do this themselves. Um, and I think uh, if anybody wants to dig into uh, a lot of what you do. Where can people go uh, to find some of that? The best is probably my YouTube channel because I've got uh, tutorial videos on the illustrations that I do. Or um, I learned a lot with the Kickstarter. It did really well. So there was a, a video on the secrets that I learned from Kickstarter. Um, uh, but there's also some really cool behind the scenes videos for Aladdin 3477. So if you just go on YouTube and look up uh, Matt Bush, you'll find me right away. Well, Matt, I want to thank you again, man. Uh, we're, again, we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience. Uh, but you are a fascinating, uh, super duper talented guy and uh, very admirable what you do. You. I, I, I draw inspiration from your drive. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, and I think a lot of people out here do. So let's give it up for Matt real quick. And we're there. <laughs> now, uh, I'm sure people have some questions, so let's, uh, if you have a question, why don't we, like, maybe even, like, form a line or something, like, come over, you can just jump up and come over. That works. Right side. Oh, that's, okay. Are I'm... we going to hand them the mic? Oh, you have a mic? No, I'll give oh, them your mic. mic. Okay. <laughs> or, yeah, maybe we don't need a mic, but we can repeat the questions and stuff like that, okay. I think, yeah. It's Eric Steele, everybody. <laughs> I, I guess I don't need a mic. Yeah, you don't need a mic. Well, yeah, we can repeat it. So, um, the fact that you love Indiana Jones on par with Star Wars, maybe-ish, yeah. um, what's it like doing actual work for the Indiana Jones franchise, like the prints that you've done before? And do you have any interesting stories about some of the artwork that have to do with the movie? Gosh, um... I haven't, I haven't done as much Indiana Jones as I have Star Wars, but uh, probably the coolest thing that I've worked on uh, that took three years was illustrating the Indiana Jones world map. And I actually have one that uh, someone is going to win tonight, but it's, it's a giant world map and it has all of the locations of where Indiana Jones has found all of his archaeological artifacts, but it's from the movies, the comic books, the novels, the uh, Disneyland theme parks, and the Young Indiana Jones oh, Chronicles. So there's stuff all over the world, and, and I you, illustrated you each went artifact. And, and all that I, it took me three years, and going back and forth with Lucasfilm <laughs> and everything, and uh, and I've got the, I've got a world map. Someone's going to get it tonight. That's awesome. That that has to be surreal on some level, though. You you you're 12 years old. You're watching this movie. You're it, it blows you away, and then yeah. later in life, you're commissioned to make art or make something creative officially in this realm i mean you gotta yeah. pinch yourself at some point well it's funny because you you were you know like mentioning my my drive and stuff but the funny thing was as i was a kid and a teenager and and doing all the art and everything i never in a million years thought that i would actually be working on star wars and indiana jones stuff and i remember when i was kind of first doing this and it was real, one of the thoughts that kept popping up was, 
man, if I knew that I would have been doing this, I would have, I probably would have been practicing drawing a lot harder, a lot sooner <laughs> that, uh, than I was. I didn't, I didn't think it was, you know, it was possible, but if I knew that, um, a true ambitious person, what can yeah. I, what, I'm, I'm super <laughs> successful. What could I have done better though, to even have been more successful? Um, thank you, Eric. Oh yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Sean. Uh, I actually live in Auburn Hills right now. Okay. So uh, Matt knows that I've had like a How to Draw Star Wars CD almost like since early elementary school. So I wanted to say, how is how is it kind of for yourself knowing somebody personally that's been influenced by your art that inspired them to become an artist? Like, how does it feel for yourself to that to that extent uh, it feels it feels great you're asking how I feel about inspiring other uh, yeah, and people. also knowing somebody that was yeah it, it's it's awesome and you know they say that when you are inspired by something all you want to do is share it so and that's true of everyone so think about whenever like if you discover a really cool video game no one ever discovers that video game and says, ha, 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 I'm going to play this all by myself. I'm not going to tell anyone about it. Or a movie, if you right, find. Sure. Like, I'm not going to tell anyone about this movie. It's all mine. No, you want to, oh, my gosh, you need to see this movie. I will watch it again. Let's go this week. You know, you want to share it. Yeah. So um, I've just found so much enjoyment in uh, creating art, writing stories, and all of this. And so one of my favorite things to do is is share it with people for other people that have similar ambitions. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not the end all and know everything, but what I have learned, I love to share. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. My name's Laura Verlou from St. Clair Shores. Hi, Laura. Hi. And Matt, I really don't know the answer to this. How'd you come up with 3477 rather than 3577 or 3747 or? And he hit it to the 3477. There is, and um, so what happened was um, I knew that I wanted it to, it to take place in a year, and it was actually inspired by a comic book when I came out as a kid called Spider-Man 2099. Oh, it was yeah. a a futuristic version of Spider-Man that's in the new Spider-Verse movie that's coming out from what I understand. And um, so I knew I wanted it to be Aladdin and then a year. Um, when I was inducted into the 501st Legion of Stormtroopers, I was supposed to come up with a four digit number. And the address uh, that I grew up on uh, in Sterling Heights was 4646. So I asked if I could have that. Someone already had it, so I couldn't do that. <laughs> like, man, I need a four digit number. I couldn't think of one, so I just took the letters in my name, and if you take each letter, M-A-T-T, -T, if you turn them sideways, an M kind of looks like a three, uh, an A looks like a four, and if you have a big imagination, the uh, T's look like sevens, and so my, I actually have it on my other shoulder, TK3477 is my Stormtrooper number. So kind of as a joke, when I was writing the very first version of the script, I didn't know what the year was going to be yet, and I wasn't really sure well, how far is it in the future, but I just needed to give it a number. So I started calling it Aladdin 3477, knowing full well that I would, I would change that. And uh, after I wrote the first version, I was kind of like, man, that's 1,500 years, and that's, like, that's really far in the future. <laughs> but every number I kept coming up with, like Aladdin 2386, just doesn't have a, just doesn't have a, good, a, doesn't have a good ring to it. Yeah. So, 3477 stuck. I just, I like the sound of it. There you I have go. another question. <clears throat> you have so much talent across the board with, with everything that you've done in, you know, relative to this movie. The, the production aside, what piece of art or what poster or swag item or action toy or something were you the most proud of? Or it's probably hard to pinpoint any one thing, but yeah. is there anything that just, your, the, a costume or any yeah. one thing that really um well i the, obviously the aladdin 3477 the first movie that's coming out i'm real real proud of that and excited about that the big thing that i'm excited about now that i can't wait for everyone to see is actually in the first swag box that's coming out from the kickstarter is the aladdin 3477 official collector's edition so i don't know if you remember these but when i was a kid um, these they were almost like uh, deluxe magazines but they were like these books uh, and this is before the internet but they had like 
all the characters from a certain film. And they had these for the Star Wars films, the Indiana Jones films, and James Bond, and all of that. But they would have behind the scenes and everything. And it was just really cool because it was made by the by the studios. And they would sell them in movie theaters, but they'd also have them at newsstands and in grocery stores and stuff. But I just loved, and I loved it. It wasn't just a collector's edition. It was an official collector's <laughs> edition. So the official collector's edition for Aladdin 3477 is coming out soon and like awesome. we're literally weeks away from it and uh that's a product that i am i'm uh, next to the movie i am so excited for everyone to see this book fabulous thank you thank you we'll, we'll take uh we'll take questions from uh, everybody who's up here and then uh we'll, that'll be the end of the time that we have for questions and answers so mike you're at the end over there right yeah we'll be the last one so I'm Tim. Sure. I'm from Southfield. What's your name, sir? My name is Tim. Tim, okay. I'm from Southfield, mm -hmm. and it's nice to see the gang on this side of the city mm -hmm. for once, okay. instead of having to drive over to <laughs> St. Clair Shores and stuff. Um, this is actually kind of an art question as an artist and getting recognized for your work. I know that when you do art, like for the might end up on a book cover or inside a book, that you know, uh, if you have a signature on there, that's that can get cropped off. You know, that just happens. But uh, recently, a, a friend of mine, Jeff Easley, who is a TSR artist, mm. did a promotional uh, poster for the Dungeons and Dragons movie, and they actually digitally removed his signature from the poster. Um, he's not too happy about it, but he's also not crazy. Came, but I just the question comes up about getting recognized for the work that you do, mm -hmm. and I just wonder what you know what you think about you know things like that getting recognized. Make sure you recognize yeah. Um, you know, it's a tough one. I've had uh, some jobs uh, in my career where they're totally fine with um, putting my signature. There have been times where I've not only put my signature, but I'll put .com after my name, and sometimes they'll leave. You know, they'll leave that on there too, which is which is great. One of the things, um, for the most part, since Disney has taken over Star Wars. For the most part, everything has been good, but one of the things that uh, a lot of artists are upset about, prior to Disney, we were always allowed to sign our work. Uh, now Disney, if you sign it, Disney will digitally remove uh, your your name off of the, uh, the, you know, the Star Wars work. Which is interesting because Disney is such a proponent of the arts, but not as much the individual artists. You know, they're more about, you know, protecting their brand and everything. Um, at the same time, you're getting paid very well, and um, you know it'll still say even if they take it off the cover of a book, on page three in small writing. If you look after you know the copyright and the ISBN and everything, oh there it is, cover art by Matt Bush. You know it's still there, and uh, uh, you know you still get to meet fans at shows and everything, um, and you get paid well, and you know you get to create artwork for you know things like Star Wars. It's amazing. Um, so uh, in the grand scope of things, I, uh, um, as a commercial artist, it's, you know, it's, it's the gig, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's a lot of things out front where your name's in lights, and then I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that's, I don't want to say thankless, because you're, mm -hmm. you're doing it, like you said, for uh, some of these beloved brands and, and properties, but you might have to search for your name, or mm -hmm. like you said in the film, like, you know, your name is just one of the many people that worked on a project. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, Paul from Beverly Hills. Paul. And thank you for the high quality uh, little guy here. Awesome. <laughs> what Fiji. can you tell me about the Figly? Fiji. Fiji. Yeah. What can, how how, how what, the character? Who yeah. Is. Did everybody get a Fiji? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so Fiji is Aladdin's sidekick, and that actually goes back even before it was Aladdin when I originally was writing this comic book and illustrating it called Castar Shandax. He had this floating robot next to him named Fiji. And uh, when it came time to making Aladdin, my actually I love the, the you know the Disney's Aladdin and my favorite character is Abu. But in the original Aladdin tale there is no monkey, there's no Abu, so I couldn't have Abu in uh, in my film, but I already had this this Fiji floating robot that I was like, well that's gonna be my my Abu, and I already like the name Fiji, so um, so there you have it. Fiji is uh, Aladdin's sidekick in the uh, 
in the film. There's some videos online that talk more about Fiji. So if you uh, if you look on YouTube, if you look up Fiji, you'll see uh, you'll see a lot more about Fiji. You know, it obviously it's like a, it looks like an R two D two sort of a thing or a yeah. B, uh, BB eighty eight or whatever. But I was thinking kind of like Orko from uh, He Man. Oh, you know, like okay. the floating guy oh, yeah, comes floating yeah. around. That's what I was kind of thinking about. Well, and I was real inspired by Vincent from the yeah. Black Hole, who's okay. another floating yeah, there you go. robot. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for coming out. What's your name? Um, Jacob. All right, Jacob. What's your question? Um, so what? What was your biggest idea, like Star Wars or like Indiana Jones? Well, my biggest inspiration probably. Star Wars, um, and I might have watched the Indiana Jones movies more, but the cool thing about Star Wars, it's so vast with its aliens and robots and spaceships that I feel like growing up it was a lot easier to uh, to focus, well, it was easier just to like just invent a world, and you didn't even have to, you could play Star Wars without having to be Han or Luke or one of the main characters because there was just so much to it. Indiana Jones is so specific to Indiana yeah. Jones, you can't really, um, like if you have a bunch of friends getting together and playing Indiana Jones, as soon as someone says, I'll be Indiana Jones, I'll be short round, and then it's like, oh, I'll be Sala. <laughs> there's, there's not really, there's not a huge, um, I mean, it's a cool world, but it's so specific, it's so historical that um, it's not as vast as, you know, the Star Wars universe. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, what's, your, what's also your favorite Star Wars character? Like. Gosh, uh, when I was growing up, it was R2 D2. Um, uh, so I, I, yeah, I loved R2 D2 when I was a kid. I wanted my own R2 D2. Do you have a favorite Star Wars character? Um, I'll say Darth Vader. Darth Vader? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Jacob. Good questions, man. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here for support. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good job. Great Are job. You mom? Yes. Good job, Mom. <laughs> Thank you. Great. What's going on, yeah. man? And nothing much. So, Matt, my name's Frank. Um, good friends with Tom, though. But a couple of times I host at the Maple Theater for uh, Secret Cinema. One of the times was hosting and doing a Q&A for Raiders of the Lost Ark. Awesome. And so seeing this was so fantastic, too. On before I ask my uh, question, uh, I'm going to ask some factoids. Um, I don't know if you know the person that walked Indiana Jones, Willie, and Short Round to the plane. Yes, uh, that was Dan Aykroyd, yep. uncredited. Dan exactly, Aykroyd. and then uh, the thuggy that fights Indy at the very end is, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, Pat Roach, yep. who appeared in the first film fighting Indy as the Nazi. And as the, the swordman who gets yep. shot. Yep, <laughs> yep, in the very beginning. So, like I said, I'm a big indie fan, though. But yeah. my question is, are there any, like, music composers, film composers that have heavily influenced your music taste or your your, your Latin film? Gosh, um, I mean, there's there's no comparison to John Williams. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's, that's, that's the top, and it's, uh, there isn't even a close second. Uh, I really like... Danny Elfman, and but that's a particular yeah. whimsical, you know, kind of film, um, or the, the films that he scored. Um, for the Aladdin films, it's kind of a mixed bag, where there are some orchestral things that sound kind of like John Williams. There's whimsical moments that are kind of Danny Elfman, but it's also in the future, so there's a lot of really cool um, uh, cell dweller music that kind of sounds almost techno or dubstep. And then, because it takes place all throughout Asia and India, there's a lot of world music and almost Bollywood-sounding stuff. So it really is kind of a, uh, a mixed bag, uh, depending on what the scene is. Um, but I'm, in, I'm inspired by everything. Uh, there isn't much music that I don't like, honestly. You had mentioned, too, about uh, Indiana Jones, like, playing as kids. You know, if you play Indiana Jones, it's very specific, where Star Wars, there was much more like a, a world-building that you could kind of jump into that world. Mm -hmm. What can we ex expect with the Aladdin films? Like, if, if, if a kid is going to watch that, yeah. are they more specific adventures, or did you go into it trying to do more world-building? I think um, it's definitely more world-building. The first film is probably the closest to what you would expect for an Aladdin adventure and probably feels more like an Indiana Jones adventure. And once that first film kind of lays the land, by the time you get to the second film, 
there are so many new characters and locations and ships and it kind of just takes the world that you thought you knew and kind of turns everything upside down. Fabulous. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Mike. I'm from Farmington. Uh, I've watched this a couple times at home, and watching at home does not do it justice. Yeah. You need to see this on the big screen. Yeah. Because it's like pretty epic in scope. So it's like widely known that uh, Spielberg based these movies on like adventure serials of the 30s and 40s, and there are so many times when they're in the jungle with all these creatures and all these random creatures and this like the jungle itself that it felt like the only thing missing was King Kong. And I'm wondering if Spielberg like ever like was aware of that and like kind of was trying to make his own version of King Kong because he loves movies like that especially so. Yeah. Yeah, gosh, I I I'm not sure. I just love there is th this movie has it has it all and uh and I was telling Tom uh right before we started it's so funny because this movie is just like a, such a roller coaster of a film, and there's an actual roller coaster <laughs> in it, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They, they uh, Spielberg talked about it years later as you know him and George Lucas were both going through a divorce at the time that they made this, which they uh, a credit to the darker tone. Um, they were just going through some stuff, uh, so th that that's part of it. But I'm sure that there's. You know, those influences, movies like King Kong, I'm sure, are influencing everything that those, yeah. you know, especially young filmmakers are I got are waiting for them to come out, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, thank you. That was a, a great answer to questions. We're going to do the raffles in a minute, but before we do that, Matt, are you ready for the Santilli Stinger? I am. <laughs> all right. I'm going to pull Go these up. It, Tom. So, again, these are, what's that? Go for it. Yeah, all right. This was the big hit at the McCarty thing. This was the thing everybody came over. They're like, you need to keep doing that. Uh, let me pull it up here. So again, if you ever watch Inside the Actor Studio, uh, James Lipton inter uh, interviews actors. At the very end, he credits this uh, questionnaire that he asks people uh, certain questions to Bernard Pivot, who is a guy that I don't know who that is, but he always says that's who it is. And then also uh, Colbert questionnaire. Once in a while on the show, he'll do a Colbert questionnaire where he'll ask people very specific questions. I've stolen from both of them. Uh, and also from Bernard Pivot, and then I've also mixed in my own stuff, and we're calling it the San Philly Stinger. Okay, are you ready for this? It's 14 questions. Okay. You ready? And is it timed? Like, I have to answer right away? Is that the thing? <laughs> no, the no. Oh, yeah, okay. you can think about it or expand or give your, your answers okay. or your answers. Okay. So there's no, there's no right answers, except for one of the questions. Uh, okay, the, the first one, uh, what is your favorite word? Pumpernickel. It's <laughs> a great word. It's a great word. Least favorite word? Oh, moist. <laughs> Those are both correct, actually. That is the correct answer. Uh, who plays Matt Bush in the story of your life? Oh, gosh. Um, young or old? I guess uh, now. Uh, Vin Diesel. <laughs> Does he have the range to pull off Matt Bush? Um... Gosh, I'm trying to think. He, well, he can say, I am group pretty convincing. <laughs> yeah. Daniel Day-Lewis? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Okay, uh, number four is, Matt, what is the best movie theater candy? Oh, gosh. Um, when you take, when you take milk duds, but you put them in your buttery popcorn and kind of sprinkle them in, shake it up a little bit, and get some nice, some nice chewy, chocolatey surprises every now and then. That is amazing. How many yeah. people have heard of that before? Because here's what's interesting about that is that is Darren McCarty's favorite. Exactly. Really? <laughs> yeah. You're kidding. Before he, he tells a story where he got his teeth knocked out or whatever. But prior to you know, when he had teeth, that's what he that was his go-to. Yeah. And I had never heard that, and now you say that wow. too. That's great. Uh, Number five, what's the most used app on your phone? Gosh, um, probably just messaging. Messaging? Facebook yeah, message? Or, uh, no, uh, just uh, texting. Texting? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, now, you've done a lot of stuff, but number six, this is again from the James Lipton thing. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Gosh, um... These are tough. Something that I that I haven't done? Yeah. Oh man. Um 
I would like to run a swanky tiki bar and like manage it and just like, but somewhere like, I don't know, off a, a swanky tiki bar. That's yeah, awesome. that's a good but like, like with torches and it almost looks like Indiana Jones, but like <laughs> off a beach somewhere. That's a swanky fun. tiki bar. Yeah. That's where you can find Matt. Uh, number seven is what profession would you least like to attempt? Oh gosh. Um, accounting. Accounting. That's pretty yeah. boring. Yeah. Sorry, any accountants? Accountants? Yeah. Accountants? Accounters? That's not the word. Uh, your earliest movie memory. Uh, the, if I'm not mistaken, the first film that I saw in a theater was Popeye. Is that right? Williams, I, I believe no so. Way. I think that was the first film I saw. Wow, we have a, that connection. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay, okay. That's a classic, by the way, anybody wants to go watch it. It's not very good, but it's great to me. Um, this is kind of a random specific question, but I'm always asking people this, uh, and you can say whatever you'd like. Number nine is, uh, what's the best sports movie of all time? Um, I'm not a, oh, I have an answer. Um, I have two answers. I'm not a sports guy, so I don't watch a lot of sports okay. films. Uh, my, my, Probably the best serious answer I really liked. I didn't think I was gonna like it, but I really liked Jerry Maguire. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, just, I just thought that was a great film. Um, Jerry Maguire fan over there. Yeah. But my favorite sport, my favorite sport film is basketball. Yeah. <laughs> that's great, man. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, the, uh, Trey South Parker. Parker. Yeah, Trey Parker. Yeah, Trey Parker. Yeah, Trey Parker. Um, basketball. That's great. You, that is a movie that is for sports. It's a sports movie for people that don't. You don't need to know anything about sports to get, get into basketball. Uh, this is a loaded question, so forgive me for asking, but it's on the questionnaire, so I have yeah, to. Sure. Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh, Star Wars. Of course. Even further, I, this is interesting uh, to ask from you: Kirk or Picard? Gosh, um, I. I'm the wrong person to ask because I haven't watched enough. I'm gonna say Picard, okay. just for uh, for all the you know represent for all the bald guys out there. <laughs> <laughs> <Hear that>. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, number twelve, what's a famous slash classic movie that you admit you have never seen? The Godfather. Shut up. Not, really? But let, let me say this though. Uh, up until recently, I had never seen Citizen Kane, and okay. I finally saw that a year ago and blown away. I can't believe how good that is. Okay, it's okay. Amazing. So, no Godfather, no I kidding. Seen, you know, I've seen so many clips of it. I probably have you seen the whole like thing. I feel it, like I've it, seen it, it but okay. I, I haven't actually sat down and okay, watched okay. it. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, it is. The last two questions, these get a little deeper. Uh, these are the last two questions for you. And then we'll get to the raffles. Number 13, uh, Matt Bush, your definition of the word success. Gosh, um, man, if I thought about it, I'd probably have an amazing answer. Um, I think success is, um, well, it's different to everyone, but I think success, oh, I've got a good one. Um, success is when you, I would say success is when you fail, but you take what didn't go right, and you say, well, what didn't go right? And then, all right, I'm gonna do it better. I'm gonna do it better next time. That's success. Okay. People that, uh, that don't give up when they fail, but when they, um, when they learn from, from what didn't go right, that's success. That's great. Final question, this is directly from the Stephen Colbert questionnaire. Describe the rest of your life in five words. <laughs> you could take a minute for that. Uh, I'm gonna rock your world. <laughs> there you go. All right, there you go. Matt Bush, everybody.